Oh, come on. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. And we are talking about the river of life. The river of life. And um, this week's message is called Broken Cisterns. Broken Cisterns. You don't want to be drinking from a broken, leaky cistern. You want to be drinking from the living water. Jeremiah chapter 2, the word of the Lord came to me, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. The Lord says, remember how it was when you began, you were so in love with me and there was such a great relationship. Come down to verse 7. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. That doesn't sound good, does it? Right? So what did they do? Let's, let's read. What did they do that defiled the lamb? Uh, the priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the Lord did not even know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, which means the devil, following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring this charge against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children and their children. God's wanting to get, waiting for a generation to wake up. Cross over to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedah and observe closely to see if there's ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not even gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled. Everyone say, be appalled. That's strong language. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror. I mean, that doesn't sound good, does it? declares the Lord. Here's why. Verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this morning. We thank you for your presence. We pray that you would come and speak to our hearts today. God, if any of us here have been drinking from broken cisterns, Muddy water, forgive us, O oh God. Help us today to come back to the living water, to come back to the fountain of life. Speak to our hearts. We want to be living from the presence, person, and power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So if you joined us this morning, last week we began a series talking about the river of life. And we talked about Revelations 22 where John said he saw the river flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb right through the middle of the street of heaven. The tree of life was there. And then Ezekiel sees the river flowing out from the temple all the way through the, the desert to the sea with trees again on each side of the river. And there's fishermen there. And there's life wherever the river goes. And it touches the sea, which talks about humanity. So the river is not just for you know, heaven, the river of life is to flow down into our lives today. And we talked about how Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew who I was, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And then he says in John chapter 7, he stands up on the last day of the feast and he says, if anybody's thirsty, come to me. If you believe, as the scripture says, I will put within you living water. Living water will flow within you. This is not natural water. This isn't natural water. I'm, I'm grateful that I have some water here this morning. And it's, it's good to drink natural water. But this verse is not about natural water. This verse in this passage, this river is spiritual water. It's the water that our soul drinks. We have a body and we have a soul. And our soul thirsts for that living water, that spiritual water. Your soul was made to drink and when Jesus cried out, if anybody's thirsty, he was talking about spiritual thirst within us. What are you drinking from today? What are you watering your soul with? Is it the living water, the river of life, or is it a broken cistern? I was praying this week and God just drew my focus to this word living. What does living mean? What is, what is the difference between living water and dead water? And I was like, okay, why do you want me to look at this word living, Lord? 
And and so I did some research, did some study, and in the Mediterranean, in that kind of area, it's fairly dry, and so uh, it only rains a couple of months, a few months of the year. And so they had two types of water. They had water which came from rain. I mean, it was pretty dry, but when the rain fell and the rivers began to flow, the barren land turned green. It was just amazing. It made everything come to life. But the, the living water they called was the, the rain from heaven or the spring that came up of the, out of the ground. It was water that they said, this just came from heaven. This came from, from God. He supplied this water. And wherever that water went, it produced life. For the rest of the months of the year, they had to drink. So they built for themselves these cisterns. They built holes in the ground like an underground water tank, if you like. And so they would build the cistern and they'd keep the water in there. That water wasn't flowing. It wasn't moving. So it wasn't considered living water. It was, if you like, dead water, stagnant water that's not moving. So this phrase, living water, talks about water that comes either as rain or that comes as a river. It's flowing, it's falling, it's moving in our lives. So they had this, this phrase called living water. And living water, when it fell or when it moved, it brought life. And this, war, this phrase became kind of uh, connected to the presence of God. The presence of God was described like living water. It brought life to your soul. And so throughout the Bible, we read this, that the living water, the flowing water, is the presence of God, comes directly from God. So this verse here, we read that the heavens shudder. And, uh, you know, there's this great horror. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken the living water and dug their own broken cisterns in the ground. Now, this is, this is not a commentary on plumbing, okay? You're allowed to have a water tank. It's not what this is about. This is about something spiritual going on here. God says, why would you go and drink from this broken cistern that's got some muddy water at the bottom of it because it all leaked out anyway? Why would you go there and drink that muddy water when right over here is a spring of living water, flowing water? I think I know where I would go for a drink, right? I would go to that water that's pure and that's clean and that's flowing rather than something that's muddy at the bottom of a, of a system that's all leaked out. And, and so there's this, this kind of comparison here that's describing our relationship with God. And I want us to consider four broken systems that I notice people drink from. The first is the cistern of vanity. Thus says the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain. If you look at this passage, it starts with vanity. God says, vanity has led you to build this cistern of your own. Vanity is the excessive belief in one's own ability or attractiveness. We begin to become absorbed with ourselves. We begin to think that it's all about us, about us. As we read through here, we see the end result of vanity is drinking from a broken cistern, some muddy water. Other translations translate this passage as following worthless idols and becoming worthless. Whatever we follow, whatever we go after, we become like it. It is a uh, Kiwi word we, we use to describe this. It's called cockiness. Cocky, that guy's just too cocky. He's just full of himself, thinks he knows it, you know, knows it all. This is the system of vanity. Our confidence should not be in ourselves, but our confidence should be in the Lord. I'm confident because I know the Lord is with me. I am confident because God is my shepherd. He's my redeemer. He's my healer. He's my provider. So I have confidence because of the Lord. My confidence, if it's based in my own ability, my own strength, it's like a leaky cistern. It's my own vanity. It's my own mere flesh, my own skills, my own ability. And that will be, that will be like a leaky system that will dry up after some time. But when my confidence is in the Lord, I have an everlasting supply of living water. Amen. My confidence is not in my natural ability, but in God's supernatural power within me. My confidence is not in my own ability to map out my future, but it's in His direction and leading as He walks beside me into the future that He has planned for my life. My confidence is not in my bank account, but in the fact that He is my provider 
that He is the one that gives me the, the, the job, the skills, the resources that I need for life. My confidence is, is not in my own strength, but in His protection, in His hand upon my life guiding me. I was recently at a, a prayer meeting and um, I was praying and it was a long prayer meeting. It went on for 12 hours and uh, a group of churches praying together. And I was just praying for an hour or so over in the corner and this woman I didn't know, this older lady came up to me and she said, I see an angel over you and the angel is guarding the purpose and the plan and the destiny that God has for your life because he has a, 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 he's been commissioned to, to make sure that what God has purpose for your life actually comes into, into being. And that was very encouraging for me. But I want to tell you this, that God has a purpose for your life and that God has set His angels guard over your life. That while we are walking with the Lord, that while we are walking in His purpose and His plan, listening to Him, that we are walking under His covering. My confidence is in His protection and is His, pro His provision is not in my own ability. I don't want to put my confidence in like my skills, like I'm so great, I'm so good, like I can do this. That is foolishness. That brings a curse upon our lives. Later on, Jeremiah says this in chapter 17, verse 5. He says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched place of the desert in a salty land where no one lives. They're in the salty marshes. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It sounds familiar, doesn't it, right? Psalms chapter 1, Ezekiel. It has no worries in the year of drought, never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful. So it changes gears here. It's talking about being planted by the river, that if you trust in God. And then it says, it just changes. It says, actually what causes us to start trusting in ourselves and to not trust in the Lord is our heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Then God says, I understand your heart. The Lord searches the heart, examines the mind to reward each person according to their conduct. Verse 11, like a partridge, which is a bird that, Hatches eggs that did not lay are those who gain riches by unjust means. When their lives are half gone, their riches will desert them. And in the end, they will prove to be fools. And begins to talk about the throne. In verse 13, it says, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Our God describes himself as the spring of living water. The presence of God is this fresh flowing river of living water rather than the broken cistern of vanity, self-reliance. I was thinking to myself, why is it that anybody would walk away from the presence of God, the living water of God, and go and drink from this broken cistern that they have made themselves? I think we think our cisterns are pretty great. Somebody... <clears throat> makes a gifted, you know, God's gifted them in carving maybe. And uh, they carve this thing and uh, it looks pretty cool. And it's overlaid in gold and everybody looks at it and goes, wow, that's amazing. Maybe they are gifted with stone and they carve this idol out of stone and people look at it and go, whoa, did you do that? That's awesome. Maybe they, they make that thing out of steel and put four wheels on it. And everyone goes, whoa, that looks amazing. I don't know. There's so many different idols that we can have in our lives, isn't there? Things that we look at that we've created. And we begin to look at those things and we go, whoa, that's amazing. Look at that. And people say, that's awesome. And we begin to kind of enjoy the accolades. We enjoy what people are saying to us. Look at what you've done. It's so good. It's so awesome. And our hearts drift from God, our Savior, and our Creator. And our hearts begin to be filled with a bit of pride. And we begin to just slowly, we begin to put our, our focus and our, draw our value and our worth from the things that we have created with our own hands. And the angels in heaven look down. God says to the angels, have you seen this? 
Have you seen how horrendous this is? Look what they've done. Because the angels go, God created the heavens and the earth. God created them, gave them life, created a billion stars, hung the planets in the sky, and get, created those things called elephants and giraffes and lions and all of that amazing stuff down there. God made them and gave them this stuff. And now they've made this little thing called a car. And now they become so possessed in it, they, they drive around in it thinking they're cool because of their thing and they, they spend all their money on it and all their energy and time polishing it and looking after it. And they think this is the thing that defines them. This is the thing that gives them purpose and meaning in life. What are they thinking? Why have they left the living water and gone drunk out of their own broken system? The vanity of it all. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, the vanity of pleasure, the vanity of pursuing after, you know, uh, gain and the vanity of all these different things, these idols that we go after, we think will somehow satisfy the thirst of our souls. And Solomon says, it's all vanity. It's all vanity. Why don't we come back to fearing the Lord and keeping His commandments? That's what we ought to do. We ought to be drinking from the living water. Jeremiah is, is calling our attention to this. And I've had this verse in my heart and my mind this week, and I've just been thinking, Lord, forgive us if we've been drinking from broken cisterns rather than the living water. The second cistern is the cistern of religion. The priests, in verse 8, the priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. They did not even know God. My goodness, you want to make sure that your pastor knows the Lord. Check him out. Make sure he's just not up there talking a whole lot of knowledge, but there's no relationship with God. The broken system of religion. I've, I've been in churches. All the systems are right. All the lights, the projectors, the music, everything. But there's no presence of God. The power of God left the building a long time ago. Let us never be a church that knows how to go through the religious motions, but doesn't actually desire God, doesn't actually want His presence and love Jesus. That's what we're about, amen? There's a, there's a great lesson in Deuteronomy chapter 11 for us where, God is talking to His people about the land that He's going to bring them into. And He says, The land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as a vegetable garden. In other words, in Egypt, you went down to the Nile, you got your bucket of water, you carried it down and you poured it on your vegetables and you watered the garden. You grew your fruit and that's how you did it. God says, It's not going to be like that in the land you're coming into. The land where you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It is a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. And so he goes on, so if you're faithful to obey the commandments, then I will pour out the rain. I'll pour out the living water. But be careful that you do not Disobey the commandments because otherwise, or stop following the Lord, otherwise there will be times of drought. So here's this thing, here's this interesting thing. In Egypt, Egypt, you could supply your own garden with water by your own man-made irrigation system that you created to water your plants. But God says, I'm taking you into a land where you won't be able to do it in your own man-made strength. You will have to rely on me to provide the rain from heaven. I want this to be a relationship. I want this to be a two-way thing where it's not your skill and not your ability, but it's actually your reliance upon the Lord. Come on this morning. Come on. God doesn't want you to walk in a life, to live out of some kind of plan that you have planned for your life that's all about your skills and all about your resources and all about your ability. I want to tell you this morning, if you're living a life that's just limited by what you can do, you haven't actually begun to step into the river yet. You're living back in the Nile. 
Because it's just about, well, I can make this happen and I can do this and I can do this. God wants us as a people to live lives that require a reliance upon Him, where we have to step out on the water and begin to trust Him. God says, I'm bringing you into a land where you won't be able to do this unless you're doing this with me, unless the rain is falling. Come on this morning. He doesn't want us to do church in some kind of man-made religious sort of way where we're just going through the motions. This, this feast called Tabernacles in John chapter 7, they, they had a special thing they did. It wasn't actually what God had required of them, but it wasn't such a bad thing, but it was just something they were doing where they were celebrating the verse in Isaiah where it says, with joy you will draw, draw water from the wells of salvation. And so they said, that's the wells in the promised land. So on every day of that seven-day feast, they would go down and they would draw some water out. The priests would draw some water, carry it back up to the altar, and they would pour the, order, the water out on the altar as an offering to the Lord. And so people would come and they would do this day after day for the seven days of the feast. On the eighth day, they would go down and they would put their their jug in, but they would draw no water out. They would bring it empty and they would come to the altar, walk around it seven times to celebrate Jericho, and then kind of hold an empty jug there as a sort of symbol of the, the, the generation that hadn't listened to God and had sort of... He died in the wilderness. So they went through this ritual day after day. And on the last day, after they're standing there with this empty jug, this man, this young rabbi called Jesus, you can kind of picture it in your minds. They're all sitting there thinking, what have we got an empty jug for? He stands up and yells, if anyone's thirsty, come to me and I'll put living water within them. If anybody's tired of this religious ritual that we do day after day, that kind of is something with physical water, but doesn't get what this is really all about, come to me and I will give you living water. If anybody's tired of just coming to church week after week, going through the motions, just going through the kind of daily grind and feeling like, man, I'm dry. Man, I'm, in, I'm empty on the inside and they want some living water. Come and I will pour it into your heart and your life. There's a, there's a system called religion and we can drink of it like any other place can drink of it. When it becomes about a ritual, it becomes about I, I'm do, doing my thing. I'm going through the motions. We come and we... Sing like this, and we listen, and go, that was a nice sermon, and we go home. But we don't have a real relationship with God. We're not drawing from the living water. We're not allowing the river of God to flow in us, through us, and out of us. The psalmist said, As the deer pants for streams of water. So my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God. Do you thirst for God? When we're worshiping this morning, do you thirst for the living God? When when you're hungry for Him and you're just like, God, I, I can't go on anymore without your presence. That's how we are to live rather than going through ritual. The third cistern that we drink from is the cistern of offense. Second Kings chapter 5. There's a story of a man called Naaman, and Naaman has leprosy. A little girl tells him you need to go to uh, Israel. There's a prophet there, so he makes his way to this prophet's house. And I don't know what the conversation was like on the chariot, but maybe it was a little bit like, hey, how's this gonna, how's he going to do it, you know? Is he going to do this, do this? It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. When you get to the house, he's going he's gonna to call out. He's going to touch. It's just going to bang. It's going to be amazing, like how God's going to do this miracle. So anyway, Naaman rocks up to the house, says, I'm here. I have leprosy. You're the man of God who can heal me. And Elijah tells him, cool, go dip seven times in the river. Go get in the river seven times and God will heal you. And Naaman gets offended. That's not what I wanted to hear. That's not how I thought it was going to happen. I didn't think that was how it was all going to work out. That's what is this guy, you know? I mean, to go dip in the river? we got better rivers back in our place. i got my own cistern back home. It's cleaner than this river here. Why don't I want to get in the River Jordan? A fence comes into his heart, and he's angry. He's angry. Oh, I don't want this. I'm, I'm done with this. Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this. A fence will block the river of God flowing in your life like nothing else I know. 
We get offended at the leader. We get offended at the friend. We get offended at our parents. We get offended at somebody who said something or did something. And I'm not minimizing what they did. It was often very, very difficult. But offense comes in. What do we do? Close our hearts. No, no, no. Just close up. Close up shop here. I don't know if I want to go near that. I don't want to be a part of that thing over there. I'll just keep myself over here by myself. Thank you very much. And that little offense comes in and stops us from entering into the river. Thank God for friends. Naaman had a friend who humbly came to him and said, My father, this is not that big a deal. Imagine if he'd asked you to do something big and great, but this is just in the river. And he kind of gently has a conversation with Naaman and convinces him. I mean, you need a good friend like that in your life, right? You need someone in your life who comes alongside you and says, Hey, psh, 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 snap out of it. You're getting an attitude here. You're getting a bit worked up about this. You're allowing yourself to get all offended and like just all that. You know, I'm not sure. And I'm here to try and tell you maybe it's you. <sighs> maybe you should do what you were told to do. <sighs> anyway, Naaman listens to his friend and he goes and he says, okay. He gets in the river one time. Two times. Nothing's happening. Three times. See, nothing's happening. Let's go home. I mean, I went up for prayer once. I went up for prayer twice. I went up for prayer three times. Nothing happened seven times. It was seven times, wasn't it? Seven times. Four times, five times, six times, seven times. Hey, I'm healed. Yeah. Gone's the offense. Gone's all of the rest of it. And now he's just celebrating the healing that's happened. Would we let go of the system of offense? Would we... Throw that away. I wrote this statement down here. There's something God had been really stirring in my heart. Your fruitfulness will not be determined by your giftedness, but by your willingness to keep your heart free from offense. I want to live a fruitful life. I hope you do too. I hope you want to live a life that bears much fruit. Let me say it again. Your fruitfulness will not be determined by your giftedness, by how skilled and how amazing you are, but by your willingness to keep your heart free from offense. I've seen very gifted, very talented people whose lives or fruitfulness was cut very short because they got offended. Keep your heart free from offense. The final system is the system of selfishness. Ezekiel said this, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. The river is active. It moves. It's not passive. Stagnant water versus living water. Salty dead water versus fresh water. There are some things that can cause what was living water to become stagnant in our lives and it becomes dead, salty, leaky, stubbornness. I don't want to come to the river. Nah, it means change in my life. It means I have to actually open my life up to something new. No, I'll just, uh, I'll just stay over here, do what I'm used to. Laziness. I just can't be bothered getting involved. The river looks like work after all. I mean, you can just lie in this sort of broken cistern in the muddy water. But in the river, there's a flow. Like there's, there's fish to be caught. There's trees. There's, there's life. It's sort of hard work. I think I'll, I'll leave that to those other guys. I'll just sit back here and do nothing. Busyness. I'm too busy. Could you help out here? Could you do this here? The river of God is flowing. No, sorry. I'm, I'm too busy building my broken cistern over here. Too busy, too busy in life to come to the river. The selfishness, I want to receive blessing, but don't ask me to be generous. Don't ask me to help. Don't ask me to give out of my life. 
Come on this morning. I've, I've seen moves of the river of God over the years flow through church, flow through, you know, and people are getting blessed and receiving and receiving and receiving. But how are we pouring out? It goes weird when it's all about me receiving, me receiving, me receiving, and not about me actually blessing my community, praying for that person, loving that person, serving that person. We have to stop drinking from this kind of, you know, God doesn't pour His river into you to make you a bigger swamp. He pours the river into you so that you can pour it out to someone else. God didn't give you a pay rise so that you could have more sort of shopping that you could do. He gave you a pay rise so you could go and bless somebody, love on somebody and help somebody. God didn't give you that dancing gift so you could dance in the mirror and look at yourself all day. He didn't give you that singing ability so you could sing in the shower. He gave you gifts and talents and abilities so that you could bless somebody. So you could do something with your gifts and talents. You could let the river flow out of you. You could let the river of God be released somehow, somewhere. Let the river flow. Let the joy of the Lord, let the things He's put within you, let it flow out of you. And as it flows out of you, He'll say, all right, let's give you some more. Let's take you from ankle deep to knee deep. Go and pray for that person. Okay, I don't know how to pray for people, but I'll have a go. Can I pray for you? And we step out in faith and the Holy Spirit comes on us and I'm starting praying things. I didn't know where this is coming from because I'm ministering in the power of the river of God. For the river to flow, we must be willing to serve. For the river to flow, we must be willing to be generous. We must be available to God, not too busy. We're not called to be hoarders, but dispensers. As the team comes up this morning, let me just wrap up by saying this. The river of God will never be attractive to the vain, to those who worship themselves, who are wrapped up in their own impressiveness. The river of God is never attractive to the religious, who want church to be kind of all nice and just, you know, beautifully kind of systemized, Let's not have the river because the river's always a little bit messy. The river of God will never be attractive to the offended whose hearts kind of locked up or to the one who's selfish and can't be bothered. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. But to the man or woman who is humble, thirsty for intimacy with God, willing to adjust their plants and willing to be adjusted in their hearts, to the one who wants to be reliant upon the Lord, to them the spring of life-giving water, For the soul that flows from heaven is attractive, it is essential, and it's a continual source of refreshing direction and power. Maybe close your eyes this morning. See on that day, all the crowd is gathered there, going through their ritual, and up stands Jesus the Son of God. And He says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to Me and drink. Whoever believes in Me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this week's message. I uh, pray that you've been blessed by it. If you want to know more about the Monaco New Life Church, uh, please click on the links in the description below. Uh, we'll be back next week. Until then, take care. God bless.